special welcome to today's uh, podcast. I am excited to be in conversation with Andrew. Andrew is joining me all the way from Zambia. Andrew, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Sarah. It's uh, beautiful to be uh, with you today on this uh, important conversation. I don't know how is Jobek today. No, Jobek is good. It's good. It's uh, a little bit uh, um, cool, but uh, you know, um, the weather is good. Thank you. So just to start our conversation, I would like you to introduce yourself. Tell us who you are. Tell us about your background, the career journey that you've walked, and uh, what inspired you to pursue a career in um, information security, because you are an information uh, security specialist. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Uh, so I started my journey uh, primary school at Zikomo Basic School uh, in Indola, which is like uh, 316 kilometers from Lusaka. It's in the heart of the Copper Belt region of Zambia, where most of the copper that's going to uh, to Deben comes from. Uh, from Zikomo, I went to Kansai Secondary. But before I start talking about Kansai Secondary, maybe just to mention also that uh, Zikomo was uh, about 10 kilometers uh, from my home, which is in Indeke near the airport. And we would walk that 10 kilometer distance every day. And, and because of the distance, as we grew older, we started running to school. And one of the things that inspired me about that is uh, the distance being that great, it was going to be quite bad for me to fail. So I really focused and concentrated my energy on school because it would have been a total waste of time to be walking 10 kilometers to and from school every day and going to school only to, to fail or to involve myself in illicit activities and things that will not build me. Uh, from Kansai Secondary, I went to David Kaunda Technical High School in Lusaka, uh, which is a school that, uh, that uh, has a lot of brainy kids in Zambia, I must mention, because they pick the top of class uh, within all the various schools across the country and, and, and put them in that particular school. From that school, I joined a computer science class at CBU, but before joining that class, I had to consult with my brother because I initially wanted to be an astronaut. And my brother told me that Zambia has no budget to launch any satellite anytime soon. So it was gonna be a bit of a challenge to actually get a job and, and be on the market. So I abandoned uh, the view to become an astronaut and did computer science at uh, the Copper Belt University back in my uh, province, which is uh, on the Copper Belt in Zambia. And, and from there, uh, I didn't have a very big interest in uh, going to pull cables, uh, which is basically doing networking or writing software. I didn't have a lot of interest in that. So mm -hmm. I ventured into cybersecurity. Uh, but to kickstart my cybersecurity journey, I joined uh, a firm called uh, PwC. They have an office in Osaka, and I was uh, a systems auditor at PwC. And I think that is the starting point of what kickstarted my career in uh, cybersecurity risk management. And I've been working in various roles, and, and my last role being at Sanako, where I was head of uh, technology, uh, head of uh, information security and IT governance uh, for about four years. And, and before that, I'd, I'd worked for PwC for two years. I worked for MTN for some time. And I also worked for the Central Bank, the Bank of Zambia, as a security administrator. So I've got a rich blend and understanding of the various industries, uh, which includes banking and telco, uh, where I've uh, done some works to just uh, build my career around that. Fantastic, fantastic. I know that uh, before we started uh, recording, you also told me that uh, you, you're a husband and you are a dad as well? Yes, yes, Sarah, perfectly so. So I think I'm a proud uh, <laughs> father of four kids. 
and uh, husband to one wife. Uh, I have two daughters and uh, two sons. And uh, the, first, the first girl is uh, nine years. The last born, the boy is uh, two months. And I'm hoping uh, they can grow up to at least emulate uh, my computer science uh, field. So I'm introducing them quite early to, to the field uh, where I, I want them to be programming and doing things like that. I encourage them a lot to be strong in mathematics and, 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 and also just uh, spend some time. So I'm a kind of guy that wants to knock off by 4 p.m. and just go and do homework with the kids just to support them and just be uh, that pillar for them to, to pick some, some examples from. Yeah. Fantastic, excellent, excellent. Um, and let's start our technical conversation now by defining what information security is. What is information security? Yeah, so, so, so thanks, Sarah, for that question. I think I'll try to break it down for, for a layman to understand. Uh, nowadays, we all have phones. And on those phones, we've got conversations with uh, various people that we are communicating with. And I think with the coming in of smartphones, everybody has put some basic security on the smartphone, which is basically, it can be a pin, it can be a scan, a, a thumb scan, it can be a retina scan and things like that. The reason we are doing that is to protect the information that is sitting on the smartphone. So for organizations as well, they have a lot of information. As you may know, even a, a baker, even a banker, even a telco, even a small shop processes and records a lot of information from their transactions or about their customers. So that information needs to be protected in terms of its confidentiality, meaning it shouldn't be disclosed to people that shouldn't know that information. In terms of its integrity, meaning it shouldn't be changed by anybody that should not change that information. And in terms of availability, it means it should be available when it is needed by the owners of that particular information. So basically, that is information security. We apply it every day in our daily life, and businesses apply it. And depending on what is at stake, the level of security differs from one organization to the other, from one person to the next. So basically, that's uh, my uh, layman's definition of information security. Beautiful, beautiful. And thank you for explaining it in a very simple, everyday language that uh, anyone can understand. Um, I know that you are the chief operating uh, officer for Next Solution. Uh, let's talk about... Um, why information security is uh, essential for business today. Thank you, Sarah. So, so businesses, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there is this conversation around information is a new oil. And I think I would like to start answering that question from that particular perspective. So for every mm -hmm. business to be able to function properly, it has got what it calls the business processes. If a customer, for example, purchases something, somebody has to issue them a receipt and an invoice. That invoice and receipt has got critical or sensitive information. And businesses collect a vast amount of this sensitive information, uh, especially customer records and customer details. And by law, we are sanctioned to protect these customer details and customer records. So because a business needs that information to deliver or to meet the stakeholders' expectation, they have to safeguard that particular information. The other thing is that we are depending so much on computers. Just like everybody depends on their phone, I think it is, uh, it is said that whenever anybody wakes up, the first thing they do is to go and touch their smartphone and check what's happening, check messages that they've received and things like that. For businesses, they heavily depend on computers to process the information, to give the customers a valuable experience, and to ensure that they're able to record 
all their transactions and when regulators ask for those transactions, they're able to give those regulators those transactions. So what happens is that, what happens is that, what happens is that um, they need to protect that particular information. And because there are laws and regulations, businesses have to comply with laws, especially as they pretend to protecting customer information and as they pretend to protecting national critical infrastructure. Like your bank is a national critical infrastructure, ESCOM is a national critical infrastructure, and there are laws that govern ensuring that those infrastructure or the systems that are being used to process certain transactions are protected from what we are calling cyber attacks. A cyber attack is where somebody compromises a system for personal gain, for committing a fraud, or just to disrupt that system from rendering a service to the normal customer. So we need to protect all that. And that is why security is now at the core of a business. And businesses that are not protecting their information actually are liable to fines. They have a lot of outages. I'm sure in Jobek there's a time you experienced an outage where the system that is used to purchase electricity tokens was compromised. And that outage can cause catastrophic issues, including harming the safety of uh, human beings and human life. Much more so, businesses have to continue operating for some time, but because they have depended on uh, information systems, those operations, if there is no security, can be impacted. So in a nutshell, uh, Sarah, that is uh, the reason why every business must really focus on protecting their information and ensuring that security is part of the way business should be done. It's a risk management practice. And you see that businesses have strategies and to succeed with your strategy, you need to manage risk because risk is the inverse of strategy in, in, in business uh, conversation. Mm, 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 mm. Wonderful, wonderful. Let's now look at uh, the concept of uh, defense. Um, how does that apply in, uh, 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 in terms of uh, information security? So if you look at uh, defense uh, in, um, in detail. Thank you, Sarah. So, so basically defense in depth, uh, as we call it in security, is a concept where you have to have multiple layers of security. I'll give an example at your home. Uh, you would probably have a gate if you are living in a dangerous neighborhood and that get is part of deterring some of the criminals that ideally would want to attack your home, but when they find a gate, they feel discouraged. But it is not enough to have a gate. So you probably have a dog and, and, and you buy one of these biggest uh, exotic dogs, which when the criminal looks at, they just say, I'm not going across to, to jump into that war fence because the dog will finish me off. But even having a dog may not be enough because the dog may be compromised with poison. So the next step is to have your security cameras and CCTV surrounding your parameter. Then the next thing also is to have your doors, which you can make sure that you are able to lock when you are not at your home. So that is the concept of defense in depth having multiple controls and layers of controls to ensure that you're able to protect your environment. Now, if we bring that concept and apply it on a business, a business will have a lot of critical systems that are giving service to a customer. Uh, if you are South African Airways, for instance, there is a system that is servicing customers in terms of them booking tickets. So that system needs to ensure that it is available so that people can book their tickets. Aside that, the system has got customers' details that are being used to issue tickets. That data needs to be protected. So there is a network where the systems are sitting on. Part of that network should have certain controls that are speaking to protect criminals that would want to attack the system from the network. So you have your network controls like a firewall. Aside the firewall, that system will have a database Part of the controls on that system is to ensure that people that want to compromise a database don't compromise it. So you have a database security technology that will protect that particular database. 
and on the application layer where the people are accessing or interacting with the system, you have to also have controls to protect that particular application. And overall, the parameter or the security of the premises where the system that is processing and issuing tickets is hosted needs to have some physical security controls. So all those controls from the physical layer, from the network, from the database, from the application, up to the human that is working on the system, including making sure that they are aware of certain security controls, is what we call defense in depth, applying multiple controls to protect the system and to protect the business. And I think we should understand that controls fail, and when they do fail, the other controls that have been implemented to achieve the security objectives do come in handy to reduce the impact of the breach and to reduce the effects of that particular attack that you are probably experiencing. And at Next Solution, one of the things we do is that we help customers come up with what we are calling a cybersecurity architecture. This is where we design the necessary controls that are required to protect your business based on your business objectives and the risks that you may face. Because it's expensive to put a fence. More so, it is expensive to put a mm. security control. So that control should be applied in the context of uh, uh, protecting the business and mitigating the risk. Because if we just apply controls without that particular approach, uh, probably we will just be wasting money. Because if you are living in a gated community, in a gated neighborhood, which is secure through the parameter gates of the community, probably you don't need a tall offense. You just need a shorter one so that your house can look nice with all its aesthetics and, and features that are within your house. So security also should be applied in that particular context, even as we are talking about defense in depth. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Let's look at uh, now why um, it's important to ensure compliance with the uh, regulatory requirements uh, in information security. Um, how do you ensure compliance with the uh, regulatory uh, requirements in the security, uh, in the information security space? Thank you, Sarah. So, so as you may know that every business, regardless of size, has got some laws and regulations that it has to comply with. And these laws could be consumer protection laws, it, should, it could be company registration laws. Similarly, if you are running a business and an, an organization, I think all over Africa, ITU has been collaborating with governments to ensure that certain security laws like cybercrime laws, as well as data protection laws, privacy laws are implemented. So an organization needs to comply with these laws, uh, especially if they are processing personal identifiable information. And personal identifiable information is just information that can uniquely identify a particular individual, your home address, your phone number, your name, your uh, NRC details, your passport details, and things like that. That can uniquely identify that this person is Sarah. So to be able to comply with those particular regulations, every organization should identify or understand the environment that it operates in. For banks, for instance, if you are issuing credit card, you have to comply with the requirement standard called the payment card data security standards, which is PCI DSS for short. If you are in the European Union, you have to comply with the general data protection regulation, much more so even if you are not in the European Union, but you are processing personal information for EU citizens, you need to comply with that particular regulation. In South Africa, I understand there's a Data Protection Act and everybody should comply with that particular regulation. So as a business, you should understand based on the sector we are operating in, what are the relevant regulatory requirements that we need to comply with. Other than regulatory requirements, there are customer requirements. For instance, certain customers to do business with you, they would require you to have certain uh, regulations that you are meeting, especially as it pertains to data protections. 
So those we will call them contractual requirements. So what are the contractual requirements that I need to comply with? And when you understand that, you need to then conduct a risk assessment, which is basically to look at your objectives and the things that can negatively impact your objectives as it pertains to laws and regulations. After conducting that risk assessment, then you need to then take some actions to address any issues or gaps or things that can impact your objectives that you ideally identified. So if you are in the retail space, as an example, you are a shop right, because we have shop right in Lusaka, so uh, viewers can relate that to that. We have shop right and pick and pay, pick and pay and shop right, by the way. Viewers can relate to that. If you are a shop right and you have your customers that supply you things, you have your suppliers that supply you, for instance, with milk and bread, you have collected certain information about those suppliers, their company details, their bank accounts, their uh, stakeholders in terms of the decision makers, their location where they are, and you have uploaded that data in your information systems. So you are in scope of the Data Protection Act. So already you need to ensure that those stakeholders, you don't divulge or compromise their information. So some of the safeguards you take is to ensure that that information, for instance, is only accessible to people that are involved in working with the suppliers. And if anybody asks for that information, they need to produce certain legal documents like a court order. You can't just give out that information to anyone because they've asked for it. So those are some of the safeguards that can be taken. And as you are doing that, it means you will not violate your contracts with your suppliers. You will not uh, have legal suits as a result of compromising that particular information. So that is basically uh, meaning that you are complying with certain regulations as it pertains to the running of your business. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I know that uh, in uh, organizations, uh, especially big organizations, people can be the number one weak point uh, when it comes to security. How do you ensure effective security awareness and training for employees? Thank you, Sarah. So security awareness should be applied to every organization because security is also part of safety. Even when you're running a small business, you have only three employees. They should know about certain things as it relates to security. Let me give you a practical sense of why this is important. For instance, you are a small organization. You have uh, two employees. And the two employees are involved in making payments when you're not available. And they make these payments to suppliers. So the process for payments for you, because you're a small organization, the supplier needs to invoice you and send that invoice through an email. And if those employees are not aware, they, the criminals may compromise the email. Instead of saying the supplier, uh, for instance, ShopRite, they will misspell the ShopRite and write an email as if it's coming from ShopRite with wrong bank details. And because your colleagues are not aware of that particular risk, they will process that payment to the wrong bank detail. And money would have been moved to the fraudsters. Mm. So you have a business loss as a result of somebody not knowing how to identify a real email and a fake email. So to effectively ensure that you have um, a security program that is meeting your stakeholders need within the organization, you have to again identify what are my needs based on my business? What are the key things that I do in my business and where are the key failure points? And from those failure points, you have to develop the materials that suits your environment and suits your business. And even kids at home, we need to be able to train them about security, especially if they are using their phone Simple things like having a password on the phone, simple things that like not responding to strangers when they send them a Facebook uh, message or a Twitter message, simple things like not uh, entertaining people that you don't know who are asking for your personal information uh, using digital channels. So once we develop that material, we need to be able to cover all the relevant topics that are required 
to address the needs of that particular organization. And we have to be repeating that training so that we reinforce uh, the, the training and we ensure that everybody understands and the message is repeated over and over and over again. And the next thing is to actually do some scenarios or testing how effective is my trading program to meet the needs of the stakeholders. And I'm talking about the manual process here. So meaning it's a bit tedious, it's a bit uh, monotonous. So now in the modern age, if you are an organization, you can actually automate all these processes I'm talking about. And at Next Solutions, we're able to help our customers with automating their security awareness training and program, just to ensure that they don't miss anything out. So we'll come up with the content that is based on somebody's role, responsibility, and what they do at work, and train them over all the potential risks that they can face. Imagine within a year, you are training somebody on something every month, even for 10 minutes. That 10 minutes multiplied by a year will yield a lot of value and will give that person a lot of content within their role to be able to protect yeah. themselves. And, and much more so security should also involve things like physical security risk, especially if you are living in high uh, risk areas uh, where criminals are able to attack people physically. All that should be part of security. It should be part of training. We shouldn't leave out the physical and natural aspects of security, including leaving confidential information on a desk. All that needs to be addressed in a security awareness program. It's not just about digital. It should be holistic and covering all the needs and areas of the business. Fantastic. I love the way you emphasizing the holistic uh, viewpoint when it comes to cybersecurity awareness training for um, employees in uh, businesses or in organizations. Yeah. Then uh, let's look at uh, the biggest security issue that uh, organizations must be concerned about. What are the biggest uh, um, security issues that threaten uh, organizations? Yeah, so thank you, Sarah. So nowadays, the, the biggest issues that most organizations are facing are coming from human beings. Uh, mm. Human beings that are not properly trained. These human <laughs> beings can be your customers, they can be your suppliers, they can be your employees, they can be your shareholders and anyone who's involved in the business. When they are not properly trained and educated, they have become the easiest target, uh, whereby people would send a lot of phishing emails, a lot of uh, uh, spam emails, which will have viruses and malware, which is being propagated on machines. And because humans are not trained, they'll click on that, they'll download uh, free videos, they will access uh, sites that are not uh, secured and things like that. So the human factor is a critical area that businesses should be concerned about. That's why security awareness and training becomes critical and much more so not just physical security awareness and training, automated security awareness and training where people can also be tested in terms of their knowledge about certain security gaps that they may face in their job. The second thing is that we have a surge in research when it comes to artificial intelligence. So there is a lot of artificial intelligence tools and techniques and technologies. I'm sure you're aware of the new cool uh, uh, chatbot in town, ChatGPT. Mm. Yes, so artificial intelligence is being utilized to make what we are calling bots. Uh, bots are basically computer programs that are on the internet that are attacking computer systems. So there's a lot of bots on the internet that are attacking computer systems. And if you are not doing proactive security monitoring, if you are not doing proactive uh, risk assessments, if you are not doing proactive controls testing, if you are not implementing strong security controls as a business, you'll find that it is very easy to compromise your network and exfiltrate a lot of data that then will be used in cyber crimes that are motivated by financial gain. The other thing is the issue of ransomware. In the past, I know that people would be abducted and the criminals will ask for a ransom 
for that person to be released. In the computer world, that has also come where somebody would compromise your computer system, encrypt the files on your computer, and ask for a payment from you to be able to release those files. Now imagine you are a healthcare provider and you have all your patient records encrypted by criminals and they are asking for a ransom and you don't have a backup. You will probably pay that ransom because the ransoms are quite huge and they'll be running in millions of dollars. So every organization needs to be wary of that. And what we are recommending as next solution is for people to have a robust cybersecurity architecture that is dynamic, that responds to the business needs, that responds to the security threats as they come. Because the three things I've mentioned are just but some of the security threats that are out there. And these security threats are evolving every day and there are modern techniques and ways that people are able to discover to compromise and attack organizations. So we need to be dynamic, we need to be proactive, we need to be innovative, and we need to be responding to the changing uh, cybersecurity threat landscape. Mm, mm, very, very insightful. Thank you for sharing that. Let's now look at uh, some of the common mistakes that organizations uh, make in their information security strategies. Thank you. So, so a lot of organizations think uh, having a huge security budget is security itself. Mm. Uh, where they have implemented a whole host of controls, a whole host of technologies, and think they are secure by uh, focusing on that. So most organizations are focusing on the technology aspect of security, and they miss the holistic picture. So in, in that thinking where you focus so much on technology, organizations will spend a lot of dollars in investing in tools. But they say that a, 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 a fool with a tool is still a fool. Because you <laughs> need to be able to utilize those tools effectively, uh, whereby you're able to monitor your environment more proactively. Because just having tools there is not security in itself. The other pitfall is not focusing on the human beings. Sarah, as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, we are emotional beings. And I think it is quite important that organizations focus on the human beings. And how do you focus on the human beings? You have to have an empowered, motivated, and properly trained human being for you to meet your security objectives. So you, we have to focus on human beings by ensuring that the people that are doing security for us are well trained. And the people that are also doing work and using information systems understand the risks that they face on a day-to-day -day basis as it pertains to security. So training and security awareness, a lot of organizations don't pay attention to that. In this part of the world, I don't know if this is a case in South Africa, security is also an afterthought. IT people go and implement a system and only think about it at the day they are going live that they haven't uh, involved security in that particular project. So most systems that are out there, we security has not been involved in the whole process. And a lot of organizations are making that mistake. So we need to build some capacity and cooperation whereby the security teams and the IT teams within the organization are working together towards a common goal to ensure that the organization's security is a primary requirement for everything that the organization is doing end to end. So those are some of the pitfalls I think uh, organizations uh, are falling into uh, when it comes to security. Mm, mm, mm. Let's now look at um, educating stakeholders about the importance of uh, information security. I know you've sort of uh, touched on it, but maybe let's just dive a little bit more. How do you take the cost about information security? Yeah, thank you, Sarah. So the greatest stakeholder is always the board. 
the decision makers, the shareholders of the company. They are among the greatest stakeholders that we need to look at their needs. And you find that these are the people that are responsible for allocating the resources that are required for you to run your security program. So one of the things that uh, is critical is to break your security conversation to the stakeholders in a language that they can understand, in a format that they can relate to, and give them that reasoning and understanding of why their business needs to be protected. And if you are able to win your board, if you are able to win the conversation in the boardroom, it becomes easier for you to then run your stakeholder involvement at the top management level uh, because the board would have approved your security policy and then you begin to manage your internal politics at the top management level to drive that budget that has been allocated to by the board and to begin to drive the conversation around how do we make sure that our customers are aware of the security requirements of using a certain product or service, how do we ensure that our staff have actually attended the right level of training and are being motivated for them to take part in security. Because at the end of the day, when it comes to security, uh, it should be about the entire organization, its context and stakeholders, including stakeholders like the media. For example, if you are compromised as a result of a data breach, you should be able to have some scenarios and some holding statements that you are able to give to the media. If you are dealing with stakeholders like the regulators, you should be able to have a security program, a risk assessment, as well as an approach on how to address any gaps or queries and issues that are, that are raised uh, as a result of you being a business and existing and running your processes. So all these stakeholders, based on their needs, their influence, and their interest, they need to be identified and each of them, you have to have a plan on how to address their needs and also how to utilize their influence because all stakeholders do matter. If you leave out any stakeholder like the employee or the customer uh, or the shareholder or the regulator or the media or the community where you are operating as a company, you will, uh, you will have challenges and issues as a result of not dealing or managing your stakeholders effectively. So stakeholder management should come from the board. And I think it's one of the key um, attributes that the chief, of, the chief information security officer in the organization should have to be able to drive and run the security program. That is why we are saying nowadays that security as much as uh, originated from the IT department is not an IT problem, it is a business risk. So we have to look at it in that way. And I think for small enterprises, which don't have a budget to address their own internal security, there are a lot of companies that can be outsourced or contracted to help support you run your security program more effectively. Because you don't have to really worry so much about everything I've said in this conversation. You can have a partner that you're working with that is supporting you on security so that you can also focus more on your core business. So stakeholder management, Sarah, I think is quite, is quite important. Uh, just like we apply it in all spheres of life, even at home, you have to manage your stakeholders like the kids and ensure that you are supporting them in their homework. It's, 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 it's what it is. We can't run away from managing stakeholders. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So when you think about um, uh, security, people have always looked at it as uh, an IT function. And I like what you're saying about uh, it being a business risk. You know, there's need for people to shift their mindset and uh, realize that uh, cybersecurity or the issue of uh, security is a business risk. So how then uh, do you uh, put security as uh, a priority? How do you prioritize security initiative? when uh, resources are very limited. Because, uh, you know, a lot of organizations will always talk about uh, budget limitation when it comes to, you know, wanting to spend security. So what is that do you have organizations can uh, sort of uh, 
tap into in order to, to, to make security initiatives a priority with, uh, yeah, thank you. with, uh, with not much risks. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. So, so in terms of prioritizing security, I think I'll pick a leaf from my experience at uh, Zanaco. Uh, when I joined the bank, the security function was defunct. Uh, pretty much they didn't have uh, any strategy or structure to manage the security in that environment. So what we did is we came up with an undertaking to implement an information security management system. So a management system is just basically a structured way of how you are going to do things going forward. And it has an all-encompassing approach where you have your policies, your procedures, your technologies, the people that are involved in the process. And the beginning point for that is firstly to understand as a business, what do we do? What is our revenue? What is our turnover? What type of losses do we incur? And I think if you take the approach of looking at the losses that you're incurring and the causal or the causes of those losses that you're incurring, it becomes to be an easier conversation to say, we need a security budget of $1 million because we are losing $2 million a year as a result of security breaches. And when we implement this particular security uh, program, we are going to at least reduce that $2 million loss to about a million. Uh, and when we reduce it to a million, we will further enhance our brand and reputation by increasing confidence from our customers, by reducing on regulatory fines, and by building future capabilities onto which uh, we can use to address risk. So security needs to be mapped back into the business because security should exist for the purpose of supporting the business and for the purpose of enabling the business to um, meet new opportunities. Uh, for instance, if you want to develop new technical products or products that require some, some digital presen presence or you want to improve efficiencies within the organization, security should be applied for such. So if your budget is limited, you have to conduct a risk assessment of what are the risks that we face, what are the issues that we face, and from that risk assessment, you prioritize what are the three, four, five things that we need to address. The 80-20 rule always applies. What are the 20% 20, 20 that we need to address to achieve 80% output vis-a-vis -vis the 80% to achieve the 20% output? So you need to look for that, for those top things that will give you maximum output vis-a-vis -vis, uh, just an investment that won't yield the company any value. So security should be approached from that angle of a risk assessment, of understanding the business, and ensuring that you gradually improve the security program because you cannot become 100% security overnight. You have to always continuously improve your security program. And I think every security person knows that Continuous improvement is the only way to achieve security. There is no total security anywhere, but with continuous improvement, you keep on deterring and changing your defenses to protect the organization. So the budget should always be mapped to the risks that you face. And there are times where in the boardroom, people will tell you, we don't have a budget, we can't do this. They need to then take responsibility to accept the risks that will come as a result of you not investing resources into your security program. And, and most of the time when you make people understand the risks that are associated with that, I've never seen anyone that has signed a risk acceptance. They will always try to look for some resources to address your security. But the holistic approach should be an approach that involves your processes, your procedures, your technologies, and your people because you can't just uh, focus so much on buying technology. And a lot of security people are making those mistakes. Don't focus on buying technology, focus on buying security technology that is addressing the risk and also embed other areas of security, people, processes, policies, and things like that. That way you can have a more robust security program that is cost effective and that is dynamic. And I think as consultants, that's one area where we help organizations mature their security program, meet their security needs based on a roadmap 
not just based on a big bang, based on a roadmap so that the budget impact is gradual as you are improving the organization to meet its objectives. Because at the end of every security program, people should evaluate and see that the organization has improved, customer satisfaction has gone up, uh, security has gone up, risks have reduced and incidents have reduced, as well as losses have also gone down. Without that quantification of the security program, it's really in vain and it's really a waste of uh, resources. So we need to look at security in that particular context and perspective. Great, great points uh, that you raised. Then my next question would be, how do you then assess the effectiveness of a security control or a security solution put in place? Thank you. So, so effectiveness should be, uh, should start with the objective, really. There is uh, what we are calling the go casket uh, in one of the frameworks that we use for security, where you cascade the business objectives to the security objectives, it should always start from there. So if the business has an objective to grow the customers by a million and, and using digital means, from a security perspective, it should mean something for you and you come up with very clear objectives, that is smart objectives, objectives that can be measured, objectives that can be attained, objectives that are timely. From those objectives, when you implement anything, whether it's a policy, whether it is awareness and training, whether it is a technology, or whether it is a process, or whether it is a recruitment that you have done, it should at least give you a picture of how those security objectives are mapping to support the business. So if you have a security objective that is not aligned to the business, already it means even measuring that objective is pretty much a waste of time. So when you come to controls, if you implement a control, for instance, like a, a control for all IT admins not to have uh, elevated access to your systems to maybe prevent them from doing internal fraud because internal fraud is always a big issue. So we implement a control we call a privileged access management system. In the year before you implemented, if internal fraud was at 1 million runs, when you implement that particular system and you assess it in year one, at least you should see that internal fraud reduce or be uh, or start happening in another way that ideally uh, uh, you never knew in the business. That way it means your security program is working and that control that you've implemented is effective. So the way we set objectives in security should be important and should be linked to the business so that as we implement initiatives, those initiatives can be assessed as and whether they have attained certain value for the business or not. And there are times when controls do fail and usually it happens when you are just implementing technology without cascading or mapping into the business. And, and I think those are the things as, as consultants we try to address for our customers so that they don't fall into the trap of just investing and then they can't see value. So we have to communicate and measure and, and ensure that we are able to benchmark from how we are performing this year to next year or month on month or week on week and things like that. Wonderful, wonderful. What a great conversation this has been, uh, uh, Andrew. Such great insights that are very useful. And useful. As we wrap up uh, the conversation, do you have any closing remarks? Yeah, so in terms of uh, closing remarks, Sarah, I think uh, uh, this is really a beautiful conversation uh, around uh, security that you bring to the table. And uh, what I would just uh, maybe try to also say is uh, when it comes to the security function, I think the positioning of the security function within the organization uh, varies and differs from one organization to the next. But uh, for big organization, what we are recommending is that it should be quite strategic for the organization to really have a huge focus on security, especially if they are depending on technology, if they are depending on critical and sensitive information and things like that. And then for young people out there, 
my encouragement to them is um, to at least understand some of these new trends, uh, like cybersecurity. It's a very new trend, and uh, there's a very big skills gap in the cybersecurity space. So it's very important that they should understand this particular space and think of it as one of those lucrative areas where they can venture into because we're in the information age. So protecting that information is quite important and critical. And a lot of people are becoming vulnerable to attacks. Uh, if you can imagine a person that is using a pacemaker in their heart and that pacemaker is connected to a server so that they can monitor their heart condition and their health and that server gets compromised and that person is shut down. So there are those issues and really human issues uh, where security and safety have to be prioritized. So it's one area I think I would encourage a lot of young people to venture into and see how best they can, uh, they can support and protect uh, sensitive information. It's an open area, you are not restricted by the kind of degree you have done. As long as you have an interest in information, you are welcome in this particular field. That's why it's called information security. It's not IT security, as most people would say. We need to call it information security because it's all about protecting the business and its information. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, Andrew. It's been uh, wonderful, a great conversation. And uh, yeah, hopefully we can come back again and uh, just give uh, more insight uh, uh, because you've actually raised uh, a lot of uh, uh, pertinent um, uh, concepts and uh, perspectives. I love that whole perspective of you inviting um, people who are not necessarily taken 